go ahead and call this work session to order. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so to kind of recap, this is the second um, work session that the county court has held on just taking um, a review of the grant programs, the competitive grant programs. So the idea today, um, last session, we tackled for the most part the operational support grants. There were a few things that I want to circle back with about those um, items that were sort of open questions. Um, and then I think we'll move into the capital projects. If we have time, we'll go get into special projects. Um, but that, those deadlines are a little bit later, and so if we don't get that to that today, we'll probably do another work session just to take up the special projects, just so folks in the audience know. Um, we'll get through as much as we can today, and then we'll see where we are. So what we missed one. I missed one. Is that correct, Elizabeth? You there was one in Arlington okay. um, late December. And okay. for folks who want to see that, um, that it's on YouTube, so you're welcome to go back um, and it's on the county court's website. Okay. So you can go right. back and Thanks. see what we covered. So can I ask a question too? Since this grant affects both ends of the county, why would you not hold a similar work session at both ends of the county so the people that were unable to travel to that one could actually be part of that well i think that's kind of what we're doing now okay that's what we're doing so today. it sounded to me like you were not going to spend as much time on the operational one today and so i was kind of to be clear the, the work session that we're doing is for the court to be able to finalize what these grant programs look like we'll be doing additional sort of public information us me, me being available to help folks through those process but it doesn't really make sense for us to have the same conversation as the court twice so that's why we're we split them and why we're doing it this way um so with that let's advance the slides just a little bit through operational support um the two the two things that we sort of had left on operational support ladies there was a question about um, the matching funds that we had talked about um, originally we had tentatively talked about bumping that up to 20 percent but there were questions about what that would have done to the last last year's funding yes. bills um, so I went back and looked uh, the vast majority of folks would have easily made the 20 percent there's one or two that were maybe within a couple hundred dollars of the 20 percent so I'm wondering if what we want to do since we're gradually bumping that up if we want to look at sort of a compromise 15 which okay. is still above the 10 um, so we're moving in the right direction um, but gives a little, folks a little bit more time to prepare for the next sort of step at 20 percent and I like that. Okay. okay so that would be my recommendation and so if we take if we end up taking this up during the regular court meeting then we'd want to go through and um, amend that during court um, so to make this 15 percent so in the grant guidelines page two it references the 20 percent match so we would change that to 15 correct and then on page three merit review criteria <coughs> Matching funds leveraged. That's the percentage of the score. Okay. Instead of okay. the actual right. not what they're actually doing. Okay. Exactly. And then we'd also just fix it on the uh, secured matching fund form. The actual application. You move that to fifteen percent. So where's the other five go? Yeah. Where are we, where are we making the adjustment there? to get our percentages. Mm. Which one are we going to bump up benefit to the county or necessity? Oh, we wouldn't actually have to make any changes. Make any that. changes unless you guys want to. Okay. So because the only thing we're changing is just the matching fund requirement. Which does it add up to anything? Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the score. Yeah, yeah I was too. <laughs> That's just the <laughs> overall. <laughs> I was early. I was early too. Still. I was trying to, I was trying to move it in other things. Okay. That it was. Okay. So if we're if we're good with that, we'll just need to actually formally change that during the court 
meeting okay. at 10. Um, the other thing that we had talked about was the um, sustainability plans. And um, let's see, yeah, it's in here on page two. So I took a stab at actually describing what we were looking for. For those in the audience who have sustainability plans, this came up in Arlington as well. The challenge that we're having on sustainability plans is that there's a pretty um, broad range of organizations in that pool. So we have everybody from, you know, the, um, the food pantry that comes in and gets about $10,000 and they don't really have additional places where they, I mean, they partner with CAPCO, but other than that, they, there's really not a lot of funding sources available for them, all the way up to our school districts that have a much different and more complex funding schedule. We've got obviously some springs in the middle of that. And so, you know, for our food pantry, they may not have really a path to sustainability. Summit Springs, your path is mostly just getting residents in, so it's more of a marketing issue. So we're trying to be flexible on these sustainability plans to recognize that the individuals that are applying have different needs and different challenges. And so standardizing that has been a challenge. Um, and so we at least tried to take a stab at language so that people kind of knew what we were looking for. Um, so my recommendation for the court, at least this first year while folks are kind of getting used to this, is that we be fairly, um, fairly open to what, what these plans look like. I mean, for me, what I'm hoping that we get is that boards are taking um, time to actually talk about what does this look like for their organization long-term without county funding. And so my suggestion is that we settle on a couple of questions that we're hoping that the boards, the organizations answer in those sustainability plans, but how they actually look can be, some are gonna be much more detailed, they're gonna have projections and things like that, and others really, you know, if you've got a budget of $10,000, $12,000, um, probably are not going to be as detailed as um, some of our bigger entities. Yeah. And your services are limited. Exactly. So um, with that, the questions that I posed, and this is kind of the language that I put in here, um, I'll just read it since you guys don't have it, but with the impending sunset of the wind energy SIPs, which are the funding source for these grants, applicants for operational support grants are required to submit a sustainability plan as part of the application process. The sustainability plan should outline a realistic plan for the applicant to reduce and ideally end the applicant's reliance on Gillen County operational support grants over the next three to five years. The county court recognizes that no two organizations are alike and that each organization will have its own unique own set of unique challenges and opportunities on the path to financial sustainability. Therefore, for sustainability plans will be unique to each organization. However, each sustainability plan should at minimum address the following questions. One, if county support was no longer available, what would it take to keep your organization's doors open and to continue providing services? Where are there potential untapped sources of funding for your organization? Where could you find efficiencies and cost savings in your operations? What does your financial picture look like without county, county support in three years and in five years? <coughs> um, and then we, I just put that it, for some organizations that may only require a few pages of narrative with action steps and timelines. Other more complex art organizations may require multiple pages of narrative, action steps and timelines, along with financial projections, um, showing how increased resources and or savings impact the organization's financial health over time. And then I just put in here um, just a reminder that I'm always available to meet with organizations to kind of go through this process and ask those questions of them. And, and sometimes it's helpful to have an outside person asking questions about an entity. Um, at least I find that. Yeah, so. I like that addition, so what do you guys think about this generally? Well, I think it's what we're trying to accomplish, and I think it leaves it broad enough to that 
but we're trying to help. We're not trying to, to stop someone from getting money. We're trying to help them continue to, to function if we don't have the money. So yeah, it's good. Okay. So, what are you thinking, Leslie? Oh, I agree. It's, it, we have such a wide variety of applicants that I think we have to be a little bit um, well, and it's, and it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, this isn't going to make it cast in stone for next year. If we find this didn't work or we need to adjust it, then we mm -hmm. make those adjustments. So I have we have to have a starting point. Question, which are we just strictly talking the SIP discretionary funds or are these the economic enhancement funds? Um, is this community service fee funds also? I mean, what I, I, I'm not sure that we've really discussed what funds are going to be utilized here. Okay. I guess why I'm asking is, you know, the community service funds that come in, half of it is split. This is the county's portion and given to the city. So the city's going to be going through the same thing that maybe the port, who I'm here representing today, uh, is going to have to go through also. I, you know, I'm just, I'm wondering what funds are, are being discussed here. These are taken out of the SIP discretionary funds. Okay. It, the community service fee funds are not included? No. That's not how we're dispersing those funds. These okay. are these are solely the grants. We created a grant, new grant programs, basically, and they're funded through SIP discretionary. Okay. So uh, the SIP discretionary funds are a different way of paying taxes, correct? They are. Yes. 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 They're a different way of paying taxes. Yes. What about the, the, the reason why the previous courts ended up signing SIPs is it give the ability to spread, spread the funds to other taxing districts. I assume you're all aware of this, but I'm not sure everybody in the public does. But, you know, I'm going to read to you the breakdown of, let's just, and I'm going to use one, the health districts. We have the South Gillen County Health District is going to get $133,000 this year. It's six hundred and ten for the North. These SIPs were, fun, were, were signed so that those funds could be spread around and give some sort of equalization to all the taxing districts within the, within the, the county. And it, it, it sounds to me like what you're wanting to do is take people like the fire districts on the South End and make them go through a whole process to be able to equalize what this discrep what this discrepancy is, and that was not the intention of the previous courts. <coughs> Thank you. All right, let's get back. You're not answering my question. Is it <laughs> I just a question? Or this, the question was: Is it just the SIP discretionary funds? Yes. Okay. Yes. So is it good? What is going to happen with the economic enhancement if funds? This is not a discussion on that. We're discussing the grant program, and so we want to stay focused on this because we've got 45 minutes left to tackle okay. this today. Shannon. So I had a question about the sustainability part of that. Uh -huh. We were given $5,000 last year for the child care to do a sustainability plan, and we're now getting the questions that need to go into that plan. The plan is due at the time that we uh, give our grant to you guys, right? So is there, but I'm hearing that there may be changes in the questions for next year. So are we going to have to change our sustainability plan from year to year? I mean, I would say that any, your sustainability plan probably as an organization, you should probably treat as a living document anyway because things change over time. As you know, sometimes state funding becomes available that wasn't available last year kind of thing. So, I mean, I think, I think what I'm hearing from the court correct me if I'm wrong here, is that our, our plan is to be flexible. The whole idea is to get folks to answer just the basic question of what does this look like for you if county funds go away? And our so, change, to me, our changes aren't about us. They're about <coughs> what works best for the entities. And that's why we would consider changes is what, if what we've created here is making it more difficult or a hindrance for everybody, then we need to make changes mm -hmm. that are, because we want people to succeed. We're not here to, to 
we're not interested in in these places failing. We want to <coughs> I guess the reason I asked the question is because we have an initial $5,000 to work with, but if we have to continue changing our sustainability plan, how how do we do that? If we, I mean, we have help right now. Is it something that we're going to need additional money <coughs> to figure out how to change our sustainability plan? Well, I think um, the evolution of what's happens with your entity as your sustainability plan is looked at as you grow and see what your changes are i don't i don't think um i, I think that's just a natural progression of any business or <coughs> non-profit organization is you have that natural progression of how things change and i think that's what we're we're trying to to make people focus on i think though and maybe what Shannon's question gets to is uh, originally <coughs> last year we had said that the operational support grants can be used to help help organizations further and so I guess maybe a question for the court is is that still um, a qualified mm -hmm. use of the funds that we would be willing you know if organizations as things change you know especially I'm thinking of the child care there's new funding that's coming in from the legislature that may change what picture looks like um, long term, you know, are we willing to basically provide ongoing support for organizations who come back and say, hey, look, our, our situations change. We'd like to have that, that sort of ongoing assistance from a consultant to try to move towards sustainability. Are you guys open to funding that? Of course. Okay. Yeah, Does that get to your question? Yeah, it's it's yeah, kind of one of those <coughs> things, we've got $5,000 right now, but if we need to continue to do that, right. are we going to have to take that money from our operational money that we're getting, or is there going to be some support for that? It sounds mm -hmm. like there would be support, and so you would just include that in your request, basically, of like, you know, if it's, you know, $1,000 a year, or whatever it is that does that ongoing sort of maintenance, yeah. and continuing to sort of refine what that plan looks like mm -hmm. I and mean, I would be yeah. I, yeah, I think we're good. asking you to do this and we need to help you make it happen okay any other questions on this piece <coughs> cover it so far okay let's move on to the capital mm -hmm. project Grants. um Actually, if we can advance the slide one more. Um, let's just, for the benefit of folks in the room, let's go back through these questions that we answered last time and just double check that, that we're okay on these. Um, any changes um, that we want to make to the list of eligible entities? I didn't have any changes. Okay. Um, we change. didn't have any questions from other <coughs> entities that said why are we not included that minor. I, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, any adjustments that we want to make to the matching fund requirement, the 35 percent? No. No. It's last year. Okay. Um, and then we also, during the last court uh, uh, work session, clarified that when we say 35%, we're meaning that of the total project. Um, so for folks, there were some questions about that as a policy. So we decided that last time, but I wanted to put a marker um, on this one. Uh, anything altering about how the investment funds, uh, the capital investment funds can be used? I don't know. Okay. Going to the next one. Um, anything you guys want to change about the scoring criteria? Benefit to the county is 60%, matching funds 25%, and uh, timeliness or necessity of county funding. It seemed like it was pretty solid. Okay. Um, next, this is the more significant potential change. Um, what do you guys think about continuing with two grant cycles versus having one? I noticed that in the, in the, in the 
document. It was like, it was just at one. I made one. I made the change yeah. without, because I just wanted something there. But if it's something that we want to keep to, we basically just hold on to this one and probably revisit it. In 2019, did we have any fall grant request that weren't a recycle of a spring request that wasn't approved in the spring? Yes. So we funded the ELPS um, oh, did right. their request. And then the TV co-op was in that pool too. Okay. I'm a little, I guess I'm a little nervous about cutting it down to one year, but. Um, yeah, because it, it, you have to know right now what your grant or what your capital projects are. What if something comes up and they'd have to wait a whole year in order to do something? That's my concern about that. Is you know things come up as you go along, especially with <coughs> capital investment. What if all of a sudden your roof falls in and you can't wait until next January, March to get your roof? Mine too, and I think that I think that's something we could look at as yes, the years go by. But I think for right now, I I'm in favor of keeping it at two. Okay. Um, <coughs> so what we'll do, I think, is <coughs> then for court at ten, I think we'll go ahead and just um, put capital investment one on hold. Okay. okay. Um, so that I can make those changes in the guidelines. Um, we could also look at maybe doing. A special meeting just to take these up so that we can get those applications out. Oh, right, yeah, because we need um, So folks aren't waiting for forward. two weeks for us to right. approve it. Okay. Um, do we want to do anything about altering the review process? So right now the review team does the initial review, ranks the applicants, um, basically the budget committee sets the overall cap. Um, when we did the spring cycle, we kind of ran it through the budget committee. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't that wasn't the original intention, but that's how it worked out. And I actually kind of liked that having some public perspective and input on those funding decisions. So I'm thinking well, we I might want to look at the budget committee more of an idea of what type of funds needed to be budgeted as well, and, and why they were <coughs> why they were making the budget happen. I thought it worked well. And I like that. I like the process. That's the whole, the whole thing with the um, committee and everything. <clears throat> so what would you guys think about, case for the spring cycle, it's pretty natural because the budget committee will be meeting during <coughs> that time anyway. So the spring cycle could be run through that. Fall is a little bit, obviously, more challenging because the budget committee is <coughs> not meeting. But what would we think about <coughs> the, that initial review team during the fall cycle? asking the budget committee members if they would serve oh. as additional members on that review team. So, Judge, I, there's no reason that the budget committee can't just meet in the fall, you know, this spring and come in for a day in the fall. There's nothing that stops that. I also though didn't have a problem just doing it, just continuing it without the budget committee, just because it seemed like there were less in the fall, because it seemed like everybody was kind of geared up to do it in the spring, and I just, I anticipate that we would have less applications in the fall, but, um, so I can see it either way, but I don't. So let's explore, I think we, I think we can mm -hmm. move forward on the spring cycle, and then, um, Let's explore with the budget committee whether they would be willing to meet during the fall. Or we're interested. In or we're in either do a separate meeting or as part of the review team, the initial review team, one or the other, and we could maybe just gauge their interest in doing that um, before we commit them to doing that right. um, and see um, how that works. But I'm thinking, um, at least on the spring cycle, let's run it through the budget mm -hmm. committee. Okay. And then last time we had talked about applications being due, I believe we decided March 6th. Mm -hmm. We decided, yes, March 6th. Is that still workable? I don't know, I guess we asked the people that are. Does it work for you? That workable? <laughs> people that are being pushed by Folks the in the audience, lines. is that workable March 6th? That's okay. And then I believe you guys said there was going to be two weeks that the review committee would review them and then we would hear back. Is that correct? 
So I think what we're what we're hoping is um, <coughs> March 6th, that would give the initial review team a couple weeks to look at it, make their recommendations, and then that would give the budget committee a couple of weeks to actually look at look at them before um, the first, we'll set the budget calendar um, later this morning, but the first meeting I think will be April 1st, and so we would be taking up the grants the following Wednesday, whatever that is, the week or Saturday, then yeah. So that should give, I'm hoping, one of the things, one of the feedback that we got is that um, from entities is that they <coughs> hoped that we would engage more and ask more questions before we took uh, those requests. And so the idea is to build the timeline in so that we can do our own research and follow up if there's something that's confusing. Um, we can ask for that information that we need to clarify and make a decision. So that's the hope with this timeline is that that would not only provide hopefully about six weeks for applicants to get their application together, but then a lengthy timeline to do our homework on the on our end. So, so and that's going to be for the operational as well as the capital investment grants. Correct. The same timeline for both. Yeah. Um, then is there anticipation that the court would be able to let the applicants know yeah. before their budget process so is completed whether or not they receive the grant? Yes. Yeah, so if it holds how it did last year, <coughs> basically um, the court didn't make any changes of the budget as it came out of the budget committee. So presumably those decisions would be made during that budget committee meeting um, whether to fund or not fund. And that meeting, I'm sorry, that meeting? That was, meeting I think would be April 8th, 8th. is that April 8th, 9th. Um, that, that would really be helpful for the small local governments that are doing the local budget process that has to be done. That would be really nice. Great. Yeah, I think that would be our intention um, and that's part of having the budget deciding that the budget committee is helping to make those decisions means that that decision basically happens earlier in our budget making process and then obviously we would still need to pass the budget to make it official and do all of that but at least you would have some idea of what your funding right. would look like any other questions on this so March 6th is the due date for operations correct operations. okay, okay. Got, yeah. it. got it and our hope is on operations my hope is that we can pass officially approve that later this morning and so then the applications could be on as soon as Kelly has an opportunity to get them by up. the end of the week yeah. okay. Good. all right um, and then we had also discussed um, I'd mentioned about um, doing some sort of workshops for folks that want to come in and need help and providing staff this time since we have a little bit more time in our timeline for folks to be able to come in and run by questions if you have questions I know lots of folks have questions about how to put the budget together and make it work in the spreadsheet so we're talking about making myself and Kelly and other staff available so that you can just can come in and you know sit down with us and um, get your questions answered while you're going through that process hopefully that will help folks eliminate those questions after exactly. it's been submitted exactly yeah that's our hope is to try to get them as complete as we can um, as early as we can so folks feel comfortable with the process any other questions on this piece anything all right ladies anything that you saw so the grant guidelines I will um, fix the cycles piece of it mm -hmm. and so I'll plan on bringing that back um, and we can talk during the regular session about maybe scheduling a special meeting and getting this knocked out so Sounds good. That. Okay. Um, let's, see. let's move on to special projects. We can get that started. Um, this for folks in the audience is just an overview of what what the project or the what the program looked like last year. So the eligible entities. Uh, there was a 25% matching fund requirement, what they could be used for, capital projects less than 20,000 and events, how we would score them and the application process. This one um, has a little bit later application process. Um, 
we don't run these through the budget committee because those funds are um, set by ordinance anyway, and so we treat them a little bit differently than the SIP funds. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Can I ask a question on that? I saw that it says it's for capital projects rents less than $20,000. Mm -hmm. So does that mean less than $20,000 that we're asking for from the court, or does that mean less than $20,000 for the total grant, or the total project? I, uh, my interpretation was the capital project was less than $20,000. Okay. That was oh, no. Is that what you were thinking too? That was mine too, but. I was thinking about $20,000. I, I would disagree with that. I would say it was twenty thousand from the court. Your request. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, that's a good clarification. Thank you. Peter. Well, I, just, <laughs> I, I think about that in recent, yeah. thinking about the equipment that the ambulance service needs, and we have things that cost like thirty some thousand dollars, and so that was why I asked. The yeah. So okay. well, I guess that needs to be specified then. Yeah. So what do we? Is that? It sounds like that's was Leslie's interpretation that was anyway. Mine. <laughs> mine, mine was capital projects less than twenty thousand dollars to do that. So the project, the total project, is less than twenty thousand so dollars. Then we need to change the wording. I, well, I think that's, um, it, but it makes it a little bit simpler for us that if the request is less than twenty thousand, is really what we're looking for. Capital project requests less than twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. So we need to add the word requests. Clarification, yes, Shannon. Thank thanks for raising it. Oh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's um, let's run through these. Does the court? Do you guys want to alter anything about eligible entities? These are the same eligible entities as the other two programs. Yes. Okay. Um, last year we set the minimum or the matching fund at twenty five percent. Um, are you guys happy with that? That seemed to work pretty out. well. Okay. Is there anybody that did a special projects and found the 25% difficult? I mean, it's a small enough, it's usually small enough grants that 25% is not a, is not a big deal to come up with, so. Um, great, how about anything we wanna alter about how those would be used? We'll do the clarifying requests language in there. Um, but other than that, it seems to be, it seems to work to have the events and things coming in under, yep. under that separate um, pool. Any thoughts on it? it seemed to work for you. I think it worked good. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide. Anything you want to alter about the scoring criteria? Did this work well? Did this, these percentages mean you guys went through them on I wasn't on the review team. Um, I didn't hear any negative feedback. Okay. Andy did special projects. Did those work did. for you? Uh, they did. Um, you know, we, we didn't lay out actual percentage scores on most of them, but just in general gave more weight to certain things. Okay. okay. No changes there. Um, anything you want to alter about the review process? These go directly to the county court. Um, the review team does the initial review and then ranks the applicants, makes the recommendations. And they come to us and obviously the overall cap is set in the budget, but it's by ordinance. Yeah. I think it's doing what we, what we wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. And then um, applications, I think we did these as <coughs> they come back in mid-May. Mm -hmm. um, and usually the application <coughs> is due or available April. Yeah. Uh, was that timeline? A little short. Does that work? <coughs> <Any more> time? <laughs> So small if it's fine with us. But. Well, I think for like for the fire district, uh -huh. having that timeline so <clears throat> that it comes in after our budget process happens, if we actually received a twenty thousand dollar grant, 
with only having a what our budget total is, we would have to do a supplemental budget. Mm -hmm. I or budget like we're going to get it. What's that? <laughs> I budget like we're going to get it. <laughs> but, I would do but I think because it's it's a small piece of our grant. My and understanding you, is if we don't I get it though, we have to still do a supplemental budget, budget because we didn't get the funds that we budgeted that we were going to get. Either way, mm -hmm. just don't. No, we just don't spend it. We don't have to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't spend it. If we don't get it, we don't spend it. But I mean, that's preference on budgeting. We still have to do a supplemental budget. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not a budget expert. It, I think, it, I think it depends on maybe the size of your budget, how yeah. much that affects yeah. what happens with it. Yeah. Our budget's good size, so. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that is tricky, I think, moving it up, although it would, I know it would be more helpful, <clears throat> I have a feeling we'll have organizations saying, you're making us do three different grant applications. <coughs> you know, I can see people pushing back and saying, it's nice We're to be able to, to have this, now you want to see this. <laughs> separate um, so that we don't have special projects coming in at the same time that people are trying to do their operational and trying to do their capital. Is I think what we would probably, I mean, I don't know. I think we're just trying to give a little space so that we have a little more, so we can focus on each one individually. So. And, and I don't know, but how many people do both operational and special projects? Um, Chamber, a couple, and I'm sure it's going to vary greatly. We, the, 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 the child last care did last the year, but I mean, the chamber, the the chamber does. does um, the project spread was pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. Just a neat thing. And some of us that didn't might think of a capital project, which I have one in my mind now that might come in this year. So. Yeah. Something maybe to explore and maybe to put out to folks who are applying for both um, is whether those deadlines need to be adjusted in future years. <coughs> right now, I'm kind of leaning towards keeping it. Yeah, yeah. For now, yeah. See uh -huh. what happens this year and people need to make a change. Okay, so special projects. Um, Anything in the guidelines? I didn't put it on the agenda because I wasn't anticipating we would get through it today. <laughs> so um, we will have to bring it up on the 22nd or whenever our next meeting is when we come in. Um, we should be able to find out. Yeah. And, and then that, I mean, once we approve it, it's out there and people can start putting their, they don't have to submit them, but they can put them together and have it ready to go. And I agree with that somewhere trying to keep from having so much coming in that you get a little bit here. Because there are a lot of applications that come in for the operations in particular um, that are coming in at the same time. Um, any changes in the guidelines that you saw that you would like me to make before I bring it back? So I will, for this one, um, <coughs> get it on the agenda for the next, okay. Sounds good. next regular meeting. Um, one of the issues that did come up, um, we had questions about was reporting timelines, requirements. Right, we didn't have a deadline. We did not set a deadline. Um, for those, we had, we had decided, I think, that <coughs> folks needed to make do those reports in order to qualify for grant dollars. Um, and obviously folks who are using it for, say, operational funds really won't probably <coughs> report when these are due. So I think what I would propose is that we set that deadline maybe for the end of June. Okay. Um, and that our policy be basically like we can we could approve or the budget committee could approve those grants um, for the upcoming year, and I would just hold the grant or the grant agreements. So, in other words, people could be um, provisionally funded pending them meeting the previous year's reporting requirements. And if they <coughs> failed to do so, we just would not send the grant agreement, and they would end up not getting their funding, basically. Okay. 
because um, I think we can do that administratively and then that would still allow folks the time to wrap up their fiscal years and and have some time to actually put their reports together okay. if that sounds yeah it does okay Thank you. so is that going to be a written report or is that going to be a report to the court then? it's a written report and the um uh, the reporting forms are online okay. so they're standardized um, so if you have any questions about those um, let us know um, and it's our first time so we also are always asking for feedback on does this make sense is this is there information that we should have asked you that we didn't get like that kind of feedback because um, as we've said before this is really a work in progress and so this is our first time sort of standardizing what those reports would look like <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> I don't know. Any okay. Well, it's 9:40. Let's go ahead and adjourn the work session, and then we will come back into um, the regular meeting here in about 20 minutes. All right. It's 10 o'clock. I'll call the meeting to order. Chair notes there's a quorum present, and we'll do the five salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, <coughs> with liberty and justice for all. All right. Additions, <laughs> revisions to the agenda. So per our um, work session that we just did, I am going to pull um, 6.7, which is the Capital Investment Grant Program. We're going to make some adjustments to that, and then we can maybe talk at the end of the meeting about doing a special um, meeting to get that one wrapped up and out the door for applicants. Right on. Any other additions or revisions? I do not have any. I have the second page. <clears throat> um, there's not much to it. It's here. Here it is. It's on there. What? I remember. Oh, it's the second. <laughs> I think we got to get this down to one page. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, because I see it posted downtown, and you know you can't tell it's on the other side because they just stick it up on the thing like that. Oh, I printed it on legal and put it downstairs. They, uh -huh. they, they didn't. They didn't normally. <laughs> just a goal. Just a goal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other additions or revisions to the agenda? <clears throat> we good? We're good. good. All right, let's go into 3.0, correspondence <clears throat> and public comments. Um, we'll start with public comment. Individuals wishing to address the county court may do so at this time and at other times throughout the meeting. Speakers are asked to raise your hand to be recognized by the chair, give your name and address, and limit comments to three minutes. Anybody? Okay. <clears throat> Um, let's do correspondence. We have a couple of correspondence. Um, one is from, I think this is from um, the Condon Scholarship Foundation um, to the county court. Um, they say, we truly appreciate your support of our annual primary dinner and auction, which raises money for us to use towards scholarships for the young people in our community who are furthering their education after high school. Well, as a recap of the event, including the budget, thanks again for our special projects grant, which helps fund this great event for us. If you have questions, please contact Laura Harson, Condon Scholarship Foundation, and then it has the budget. It says that the dinner was well attended, their ticket sales, including some donations, um, was $3,800, and that their auction brought in a little over $8,500. So that's pretty good. A very successful event for us. Um, we will probably um, have Kelly follow up with the foundation and just make sure that they still submit their um, right. reports yes. report. on their standard kind of thing. But great news. And then uh, the other is from Eileen Potter um, on behalf of the Dome County Historical Society. She said, good morning, ladies. I just wanted to share some exciting news with you and keep you apprised of our progress regarding the construction of a second agricultural building. We received word this week, this was sent to us, by the way, in mid-December. Um, that we were successful in being awarded a $20,000 grant from Oregon Community Foundation. This foundation sent a gentleman to Condon to do a service <coughs> earlier this year and he was very impressed with our complex. When he, visit, uh, when he completed his site visit, he said that this could have, um, could have been done over the phone, but he was so glad he visited the complex as he would have never known just how impressive our museum is. 
We're very close now, we're so very close now that we should be able to start phase one of the project in the spring, which is the construction of the building itself at a cost of $79,250. We are continuing our grant application process and um, have three we are currently preparing for submission, which may very well lead to us being able to complete all phases. Again, we want to thank Gillum County for their generous grant. We truly believe that the county's award has been a major factor in showing other foundations how important this project is not only for our county, but for the many visitors who travel through our region. And then they, they have a list of um, where their dollars have come from so far. So, good news yep. all around for folks. It's awesome that people are using county funds to leverage outside investment. That's what, what, what and it's there make for. our community better. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to note before we dive into the consent agenda is um, for those who have not noticed, our county, our court packets are now online on the website. So I wanted to note that for folks in the audience who want to follow along and see what's on the consent agenda. And, um, and then folks who are listening at home, if you're interested, you can go to the website. There's a tab there that says, I think, um, court packets on it. And it has them listed. Um, and then for those, it's Kelly too. I guess. Yes, <laughs> especially the information with Kelly. And Kelly Kelly special thank you to Teresa and Kelly for making that happen. Um, and I think hopefully the public being able to see what we see might also yes. get some clues into why this meeting runs as efficiently as it runs. Yes. yes. So please go check out our briefings. You'll see why um, why we're efficient when we sit at these tables. So. Um, with that, let's go with 4.0, the consent agenda. Do you have any questions or comments or in our meeting? I don't. Agenda? I don't. Yeah, looks like some housekeeping stuff. And, yeah, 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 I didn't have any questions on anything. So um, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda, which consists of consider approval of December bills pending review. Consider approval of December 18th regular meeting minutes. Consider approval of December 18th work session minutes. Appoint Gillum County Budget Officer Nathan Hammer. Designate voting precincts Arlington number one, East Condon number six, West Condon number seven. Designate county roads outside of incorporated areas of Arlington, Condon, and Lone Rock as road district number one. Designate Gillum County depositories of Bank of Eastern Oregon, Banner Bank, and LGIP. Designate newspapers of record as the Times Journal and the East Oregonian. Consider appointment of Justice Court Pro Tems, um, Ron McDermott, Robin Ordway, and Kathy Stinnett. And set the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget calendar. Is there further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Okay, let's go on to unfinished business. Um, this is consider approval of resolution number R. 2019-07 resolution authorizing the sale of Gillum County real property. So this is the Arlington Saddle Club. Um, we had some questions during the last meeting about just making sure that we had followed the process that we needed to conduct the sale. Council went back and looked at it. Um, we have met all of the requirements. We did not need to notify adjacent landowners and um, that's not part of the process. Um, and so um, Lisa reached out to the adjacent landowner, let him know that we had followed the process and he was appreciative that we had um, followed up. So um, yes, they checked on everything. Um, and if we want to go forward with this, we would need to approve obviously the resolution, making it official. And then um, the deadline has actually, it's been, it was advertised in December. So we've now, done the 15 days that we needed to before we could conduct the sale. And so um, council has been, um, has just finalized um, the actual legal documents we would need to sign um, to conduct it. But um, so anyway. I move to adopt resolution number R2019-07 as presented. A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution number R 2019-07 as presented. Is there further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. We're on to new business. See, I told you her 1010 and we're two minutes ahead. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Herb, do you want to come on up? 
Kirk's going to give us a briefing today on uh, the Ferry Canyon Fire Planning Pilot Project, which is a really cool mapping project that SWCB is working on with our um, first responders, our fire folks. Okay. So, cool. Take it away, or uh, her winners for the record. Uh, I'll just give a real quick history of how we got to this pilot project. Uh, if you remember, uh, back in 2018, uh, I think 60,000 acres burned in Bingham County. Um, since 2008, uh, 140,000 acres have burned, the average of 14,000 acres a year. So uh, we have quite a few wildfires in our area. Um, but this one that happened in 2018 is over 300. 60,000 acres, I think, between Gillum, Sherman, and Wasco. And so everybody you know, got together and started talking about how can we deal with these fires a little bit better, and then also some funding became available. So OWEB uh, designated, uh, I think it's around $160,000 to Wasco, uh, SWCD, and they put in $15,000 for Sherman and Gillum County uh, to do some technical assistance planning regarding the fire. So we have natural resources that are being destroyed and so we're trying to figure out you know, how can we a, restore them or maybe prevent this from happening as frequently as they do. Uh, and so we started talking about doing what uh, as a practice is called uh, vegetative fire breaks. And so it, we would plant um, species that typically don't burn very well where they have fire breaks you know, on ridge lines every time. You know, Dewey goes down this bridge all the time. So we started mapping that. Um, they had some, some meeting, a meeting at the fairgrounds with a whole bunch of folks. Uh, and we started talking, you know, at the district we have uh, the technical expertise to do, to map um, all these resources. And so uh, we decided to kind of think outside of the box with the money that we got uh, from OWEB to um, create these mapping products. Um, at the end of the day, what we want to be able to hand to fire responders is uh, a map of all the roads, uh, the ridge lines, um, where there's CRP fields, uh, water, potential water sources. And so we went to OWEB and said, yes, you can use um, this $15,000 to do that, because in the long run, we're really going to be protecting natural resources. And so um, that has evolved. Um, in December, we met with a couple of uh, Gillen County employees, uh, with Dewey and Kristen Simmons, uh, had sent a memo um, with all the other attendees. But we got everybody in the room that really should be there. And BLM showed up. Um, and so we basically identified all these uh, data points that we can put into one. Uh, database basically and so we can create maps um, at the end of the day what we'll have is digital PDFs to give to fire personnel that doesn't need to be any sort of um, uh, mobile data <coughs> or anything like that so they can use them on these canyons um, one of the things that we talked about was you know we had folks showing up from Arizona and you know they don't know where Kenny's Canyon is and also, Dewey mentioned you have um, a lot of newer uh, road department employees that don't that aren't from here, don't know where all these um, places are, and so that'll be another thing that we'll add um, to these maps. And um, Dewey also mentioned that he would like once we have these, if we could have you know um, hard copies and all of this. So yeah. Um, so you'll start with Barry Campbell, <coughs> right? And the plan is to start with Ferry Canyon, um, and I think we'll be done with it hopefully by March. Uh, essentially what we did with the, the money from OWEB was hired a consultant to help kind of put all this in one box, and then district staff will do the, the analysis. Um, but we'll, we'll go through Ferry Canyon, and we're going to be tracking how much time this takes. Uh, and we know how much money we have, um, and so we should be able in the future to say, okay, if we're going to do 30, a 30-mile 30 watershed, we think this is how much it would cost. And we're hoping we have to sell it to OWEB, but um, what I would try to do is go to a, uh, do a technical assistance grant through OWEB um, to, to come up. With, I think we can get uh, 75000 from them, um, but then we would probably come to the county 
to ask for some funds if we could leverage um, so with over it's 25 percent but uh, we'll see how you know once we get done with these mapping products if they're actually useful um, how much did it actually cost and does it make sense to try to start doing the rest of the county how big of an area is very canyon i think it's around 180,000 acres is it I see this as useful not just for fire, but for ambulance and police and <coughs> yeah, the road yeah. department and yeah. 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 I think and going through the process, uh, what we'll we'll be finding out is what kind of data is available in Gallon County. Um, and so if there are future projects, we'll have a better idea of what's it. So uh, next steps we'll be interviewing um, uh, Dewey, Chris, uh, and then Ferry Canyon landowners. We've developed a list of questions for them. Uh, we're, we're planning on doing uh, a two-day workshop, and so we'll try to get as many people in from Ferry Canyon as we can. We'll have big maps uh, in our conference room, and we just want to basically digitize all the roads, where all the gates, uh, where our watering troughs, where the systems. Uh, do you, if the fire is going through this canyon, do you want? Is homestead protected, or would you rather? Yeah, right. What's what are your priorities? Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So cool. Very cool. It's exciting. It is. I like it when we're doing innovative stuff. So, good job, guys. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for her? No, I mean the memo is pretty. You know, they're oh. over there, Wouldn't you? Are you doing another group meeting with these folks? Are you doing your interviews first, and then you're? going to come back right. or sort of what's the next step so with the actual group? I think our plan is to, we'll have our, our workshops and our interviews and then take a first stab at what we think is useful as far as math products and then get that same core group in the room and make sure we hit the mark. Got it. If we make any changes. So sometime later this year they'll right. I, I get think back we to So my goal is to meet up right now. <laughs> you heard it here, you're on camera. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would just mention one thing about your um, memo, and that is that Shannon Coppock's name is not spelled correctly okay. anywhere in the device. Anywhere, anywhere. Yeah, uh, so our consultant man that and he's, he's okay. full on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to correct I, did have, I guess I did have a question as I was reading through this. How do you pronounce the name of the. Uh, natural veget vegetative, I can't pronounce that, um, <laughs> fire break that you're looking at, this forage. Oh, kosher? Yeah. So it's... So, and, and what kind of, um, do you have the irrigation for, to support? No, so it's um, <clears throat> a very arid, it's adapted to arid climates, and it's it's not the, the weed kosher, a lot of people have the whoa, whoa, um, <laughs> but it's, it's not... Uh, it's um, they use it a lot in Utah and Arizona. They plant like 200 feet wide swaths of it because when they have those wildfires down there, they just rip through. And um, the idea is to have that along the ridges. Um, and then it's not going to totally stop the fire, but it if we have them strategically placed throughout the watersheds, it'll slow it down, and so that'll give you know, folks time to get where they need to be. And is that also then would be a point of uh, where uh, some of the stage knowing the fire's coming to that particular sure, and break yeah, and, and you know would. that they would get an opportunity to stop it. Yeah. Uh, another neat thing that I forgot to mention is um, we're going to try to run an analysis on where all the cell phone towers are in the county and we can, that analysis would be basically a line of sight so we could and put a point, this is where the cell tower is, and then on the landscape, this is where everywhere that is in line of sight of that cell tower, with the hope of that'll give um, people an idea of where they can get cell service. Right. They need to. Yeah. Which Matt just called me this morning and got those from me. Perfect. Delaney, Matt Delaney, the guy yeah. that's doing it, he yeah. just called, actually just got the phone about a half an hour ago and got the four cell site um, addresses from me. Awesome. So um, with the map and tax lot numbers, so that, yeah, they've got those this morning. Wow. The one thing also Thanks, that you might, I don't know, um, we had a really good conversation with Damon at our last core meeting was about the CRP program oh. um, as part of this as well. What's coming out? 
Yeah. And the, the whole dynamics of uh, fighting fire yeah. around here really changed, you know, with with CRP, so you have permanent grass, okay. and then now with uh, chem fallow, where we, there used to be these big giant blocks of dirt, and there really isn't that much anymore. So that that's uh, <coughs> problematic. And, well, not problematic, but it was a lot easier to, to manage fires when there was fallow everywhere. Um, so another thing that we're going to try to do is, uh, with satellite imagery, we can hopefully predict um, where there's going to be fallow fields and where it won't be um, every year. And that would be something, you know, that, that would cost, that would be an annual cost um, to, to update those maps, but I don't think it would be that terrible. But that would be something but that important. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, very exciting. Other questions? We'll have Herb come back in later in the year to give us more updates on yeah. what they're doing on 30 Mile, what they're doing on this, and, and they've got lots going on at SWC, but I thought we'd take a bite-sized chunk today. Yeah, right. Absorb what we're doing. Thanks, Herb. Herb. All right. Let's move on to 6.2. Receive Columbia Ridge Landfill Citizens Advisory Committee 2019 Annual Report. So this is part of um, mm -hmm. the conditions that we have for waste management is that the um, Community Advisory Committee is supposed to give us an annual report. Um, and so the chair, um, Rich Harper, sent us a letter. And I just wanted to read it into the record because it's short, and then that way it's in the record. All right. Um, so um, this is the Columbia or the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Columbia Ridge Landfill annual report to Gillen County Court. It's dated December 17, 2019. It says the Columbia Ridge Landfill Citizens Advisory Committee met four times over the course of 2019. Um, the CAC was given three <coughs> updates on the operations of both Waste Management Incorporated and Chemical Waste Management Incorporated at these meetings. Of particular interest um, to the CAC and local law enforcement was the traffic delay issue at the rail crossing on Cedar Springs Road. Many options suggested to alleviate these delays have been discussed. Currently, no resolution has been adopted by Waste Management and the rail operator in Gillum County. A second issue relating to traffic was the issue of leaking what appeared to be water out of gondolas traveling through Arlington. The matter has been addressed by waste management and liners are being fitted to the gondolas to help eliminate this problem. Another public priority issue discussed was waste management's use of the Arlington Health Clinic. It had lapsed for approximately one year with a reinstatement in June of 2019. This relationship is a benefit to the community and the county as use of the clinic helps to keep it running. Meetings of the CAC are open to the public and interested persons. Respectfully submitted, Rich, um, Richard Harper, uh, CAC Chair. So, we don't have anything on that. Just wanted to note that it had been received. Let's move on to um, consider approval of resolution number R2020-01, a resolution adopting the use of county credit card policy. So unfortunately, Lisa's not here today because she is conducting interviews for our new veteran service officer oh. over in Sherman County. We were, and so, where we were at with that. Yes, so um, we, we cool. divided and conquered today. So that is why she is not here. Um, but I thought um, we could go over this and if there's anything that I can't answer, then we'll, we can always table and bring it back. Commissioner Weatherall, you have the floor. <laughs> I have a few questions. Um, I know I saw something somewhere that the electeds had seen a copy of this. Is that I was just wondering who all has reviewed it of our staff? Yeah, so all of the electeds have seen it um, now twice. And so this incorporated uh, Gary had a couple of concerns. He wanted a little bit more flexibility because his deputies work around the clock sometimes. And so some of the approval things he wanted to make sure those were flexible enough that it could meet, you know, they had people who were transporting. Um, you know, prisoners and they were in the Dells at 2 a.m. that they didn't have to call Gary to buy breakfast in the morning kind of thing. Um, so we addressed those um, and Marion had a couple of questions um, that um, or concerns that she took care of as well. Up until now, Marion actually hasn't had a credit card 
and so he uses he has to use April's or Maggie's and the problem is you can't really track that because right. he's technically not a county employee he's a state employee so one of the fixes in here is to allow him to have one since we have a budget for him yeah. Um, that seemed to make sense. Yeah. Um, and then he also, originally, the language did not allow um, for individuals to buy gift cards. And um, he asked for a little bit of flexibility on that because with April, sometimes with her victims, that's how she gets them funds to be able to get out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So if they need to travel, sometimes it's a gift card for them to be able to get gas or to pay for the hotel rooms. So he just asked for some flexibility. She added it in there, but made sure that it, supervisors need to pre-approve those, um, those purchases. So, um, but yes, the electeds have signed off on it, um, have all looked at it, and any concerns that they raised have been addressed. <clears throat> Okay, so um, the, 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 you know, like Gary, what page are you on? I'm on page two. Okay. okay. Um, the pre approval form, mm -hmm. when required, it says that approvers pre approve purchases prior to the expense. And I just wonder how that is possible. And it says when required, so when is it required? I mean, do people always have to use a pre approval? Because later on it says for it to be a valid purchase. The purchases have to be pre-approved. So I'm just wondering where the flex this flexibility is. So what we've allowed, I think, here, I'm trying to see, where are you looking at? Oh, valid approvers A. Okay. And then at the top, the valid purchases A, on the top of the next page. So, so here's, here's where the flexibility comes in. The idea is that, and this is up to supervisors to determine, we have a form that folks can, depending on the supervisor and what works best in the office, can require employees to use that form. So if Gary wanted all of his deputies to have to fill out that form before they made a purchase, he could do that. But obviously that's not workable for, some, for certain things. And so the idea is for the supervisors to be able to designate whether something requires a form or not. So Gary, for instance, could say, to his employees, here's an example that Lisa's used. He could, during a staff meeting, he could say, hey, there's this conference. Um, if any of you guys want to go, please sign up. That, that would be considered a verbal pre-approval. So they wouldn't need to fill out a form to be able to do that. Some of our folks, we may want them to fill out forms because they are often buying first and asking later. And um, that's creating a problem. So they're, they're making purchases that may be not necessarily something that the county would want them to be making. And so the idea is to allow either or, depending on okay. what works best. That's good. That's good to hear. Because I, the way I read it, it didn't sound like there was that either or. It just sounded like, you know, you're going to use it. So I didn't really read in here that it said that it's optional for I think someplace in here there should be employer. Yeah, it says approvers may also opt to accept and pre approve verbal purchase requests at their discretion. So that second line. Okay, but does that mean that they have to ask anytime they use their credit card? They have to get a hold of their supervisor? Um well in most then, cases, yes. But then this this uh, says approvers are responsible for communicating to cardholders the types of purchases this may include. So if Chet sends his people to go look at properties and then he says be sure and get yourself lunch. And that's then that's pre-approved. That's pre-approved. I just I but I think there would be some known like they would know that that was something they could were allowed to do too because yeah. that's well the way I read it that was just like every time. Anytime you have a meal, anytime you have a meeting with somebody, every time you use that credit card, it sounds like in here that you have to get authorization. But what from the supervisor. so what the supervisors can do for instance mm -hmm. is for our folks, for instance, Lisa we could set the idea that hey if you're count if you're traveling out of county business out of the county for county business and you're away during lunchtime, you're pre-approved to buy lunch. 
and she could just blanket statement that. And so anytime anybody has that situation come up, they're pre-approved. Okay, and they know. They just, know that's yeah, that, that seems pretty strict, but if I know that supervisors do have the ability to say, when you, know, when you go to a conference, you can buy gas, you can buy meals, you can exactly. do what you need to do without calling them every time. Yeah, because the vast majority really, <clears throat> Where the problem honestly is happening is with our folks. In all of the other offices, you know, if you're in Nathan's office and Kelly wants to purchase something, she almost is always turning to Nathan and saying, hey, we need to buy whatever. And he's saying, okay. So that pre-approval, like before we added pre-approval, I asked all the electeds who does pre-approval. Pretty much everybody but our people do pre-approval. Okay. So they already have their own. They already were doing it verbally. Verbally. Because I mean, in Chet's office, he controls all the credit cards, so they're all locked lock up, them up, and they, and they have to ask us. Chet to have access to the credit cards. So there's a pre-approval that's happening basically in every office except for the ones that we supervise. Okay. <laughs> so verbal's okay. Yes. So the um, up above that, when it talks about the approvers, um, do the electeds have approvers? That's my question. Who's holding the electeds accountable for their purchases? So, um, I ultimately am, okay. because I'm the one that signs off on whether we pay those credit card bills. Do they have to get pre-approval from you? No. But the they're being held accountable by the fact that the judge is reviewing their, their bill, purchases. and if there's a question, then she calls Sherry and Sherry goes to that elected official and says, the mother said stop doing that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. And I'm not talking about Chet. I'm talking about Gary and Nathan. <laughs> I am the one though that does sign when we when we issue a new card. It's my signature that approves approves that. It. And then we also have set up a situation for um, You'll see later when we talk about um, being able to raise credit card limits and things like that. The way we've sort of decided to do it internally is when it's me that needs the raise, it's Ellen and Nathan that have to sign the paperwork. So there's two other electeds that need to sign off on that process. All the other ways, it's me and Ellen. So, but when it's me involved, then it, Ellen and Nathan are the okay. are the control. Okay. Um. That answers uh, that question. Um, okay, so down in the section that talks about halfway down page three, um, purchases that are purchases that are not valid. Mm -hmm. um, itemized receipts. One of the concerns I have is that I mean I understand the fact that we want itemized receipts when someone has meals that they don't just give you a big you know it's twenty five dollars whatever that it does say. I, I, I get the. Mm -hmm. I get why we want that. But there are some places that I've gone to that don't have, that don't give you an itemized receipt. You know, some, some of the older registers, just some different places that I've gone to, I've come out with a receipt that says, you know, code or a different little word that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, and I'm just Is that mostly like meals? Is that what you're talking about? Um, no, it can be like even a grocery store. I have seen, I have seen receipts that were not very detailed as to what what everything was. Like a convenience store if you stop to get gas and bought a Yeah. Or an airport, you know, when you go out to a little bookstore or something and they give you some weird receipt that just has some so I'm, I'm sure I'm, there's exceptions to every rule, isn't there? Right, but it acts like in here that I just I'd like I guess I'd like to see a little bit of flexibility because in here it acts like if it is not itemized, you're gonna end up paying for it. Well, and it says purchases without original itemized receipts. Card order must immediately report to their approver. And I think... And reimburse the county. I, but, yeah, but that's if you um, didn't get your receipt at all. But, um, you, know, I, you know, I think it gives enough leeway to your approval to make some... Uh, see, I'm not you don't see I'm that? I'm not reading it. it. just This seems hard and fast to me. And the other... Yeah, it seems very strict and the other thing about like a lost receipt and I know we don't want we want people keeping their receipts but there are occasions where someone may lose a receipt and I just I just I, I get did. nervous that that <laughs> here's the thing it will only happen once well what if I say, <laughs> say, say I'm at a conference and I have all my receipts and then my purse gets stolen all my receipts well now that is a whole different 
It's not, but there's no, in, in our, if we're going to follow yeah, our policy, you, there's no leeway for extenuating circumstances. What I'm saying is, like things look very you, you yeah, make, yes. <laughs> if you make two, this too big of a loophole, you lose the ability. Yes. The whole point of this is, I literally, when credit card statements come in, I'm signing for six, eight, ten receipts that didn't come in a month. That's what's happening. Yeah. And I'm signing it. And right now, I mean, the thing is, is the policy is I sign it. So if I decide that, I mean, I could easily just say, I'm not signing it anymore. You don't have your receipt, you're reimbursing the county. It's up to, it's my discretion right now within the policy. I've been, I've allowed people to do that because I want to be helpful, but it's it's becoming a repeat and it's the same offenders that are doing it. It ha In, the, in uh, the sheriff's office, Chris allows them to miss it once and that's it. She won't even take it to me if they miss it a second time. They automatically write a check for the county and it doesn't happen again. I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a hardliner, and <laughs> I'm picking that up, picking that up. <laughs> Trust me, it'll only happen once. And, and I've worked in a company where you had to have these kinds of rules, or people just pushed and pushed and pushed. And it's I don't like have, we're, we don't have Apparently, we have a problem with right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm vetoed there, so let's move on. <laughs> um, just um, remember your receipts. <laughs> oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, the limit, $3,000. Mm -hmm. Do we currently have staff that are frequently, that that's not enough, that that in a month? Um, the only person that I've had to sign, well, I've had to sign two increases. Um, we've just sort of been piloting this increase right now so that there was paperwork. Um, Lisa had one because she, the training that I talked to you about where she's going That's to the trainer. Mm -hmm. The train the trainer. Um, so that one was more. The other time we run into it is in transportation when they are needing to maintain, when they've got major repairs that need to happen um, with their vehicles at the same time. So Marla ran into that once and we just did a temporary, this is one month, for you to be able to pay these bills, and then it came back down to the fifth. And that, those are both things that you would know in advance, so you can sign off and say, this is okay, whereas you know, somebody's um, not going you know to what? buy a new car. Yeah, I just, yeah. there's a lot of business, businesses nowadays, and they don't want to bill us, you know, I'm sure they don't want to bill us, you know, it's like they want their money mm -hmm. right then, so I can see, I think credit card use, what I noticed at my, my job is credit card use is just going, you know, because people want people want the money now. They don't want to bill us. They want to wait for thirty days. And they, yeah. Well, and they don't want that expensive billing either. Right. Right. Because that's an expense to the company. Yeah. Okay. Sending out those bills. But no, it's it's hap it happens only sporadically, and this is a pretty easy way. I mean, basically, it's a supervisor signs off on it, takes it to me, I sign off on it, and then Ellen just temporarily bumps it up and then bumps it back down. So this is a, the, li the limit of $3,000, that's just not an internal limit, that's on the card. It's a, it's that's hard. on the card. Okay. That's a standard. Um, so you can't go buy a new car. Mm -hmm. So don't be trying to. Yeah. Okay, moving it on. It helps provide some controls too, so that employees are spending a large amount of money that supervisors know about it <laughs> before that happens. Oh, this one I like because you guys are going to laugh at me on this one because this is the very literal uh, interpretation. What, what page are you on? I'm on page four down the bottom. Okay. What, it, talking about the cardholder's responsibility, it says you're supposed to immediately report a lost or stolen card directly to the bank. Yeah, by using the number on the back of the card. I'm the back of the card, but I've lost my card, so how do I? <laughs> yeah, I thought that too. Did you giggle? Yes, I giggled. <laughs> Call Ellen and you ask her for the card number, and then you call the bank. <laughs> and, the, and the phone number to call. So it's not something that you just have to report internally to the county, to the to the per, to Nathan and Ellen. You, you, you want the employee to contact. I'm, I'm thinking the idea is, say you had to travel over the weekend, or sometime when maybe the supervisor or Ellen isn't in the office, mm -hmm. that you'd want to shut down the card as soon as you lose it. But it, like in my situation, how do I find out that, how do I get that information if it's the weekend and I'm traveling? You I can call me and I can tell you what it says on the back of my card. Yeah. Google it. Yeah. Well, I don't have my card, I wouldn't have my card number. 
was an 800 number on the website. Yeah. I, but I don't, have my car, I don't have my card number. You have so, your name, though. They should so, be able to find it by their name, don't you think? I should just say, I work for County. County. Right. Program it in your phone, so you have it. Mm -hmm. I don't want my card number in my phone. What if I lose my phone? <laughs> okay, okay. Page five. Page Encrypt it. Five. Page five. Um, okay, conferences. We're talking about being at, at conferences. Um, talks about conference, conference information such as brochures, containing agenda, schedules, and when available, confirmation of actual attendance. That part I thought was a little over the top. Like the ALC conference that I just attended, how do I, it, all the classes that I go to or whatever, how do I get confirmation that I attended? And do we want to, I, to me it was kind of like telling the employees, well we don't, you know, how, I mean, how much trust are we going to extend to? So you would basically, in the case of AOC, you would have printed out the agenda, you would have printed out your registration, and you probably would have just handed in the little name tag that they hand you when you check in for registration. But that does not show that I attended anything. I mean, yeah, I could have gone to class that, and I could go shop, you know, I can then just look. Keep shopping. And yeah. When available. I mean, I mean, I just wonder if everybody's going to say it wasn't available. <laughs> and in a lot of times it may not be. I don't know. I struggled a little bit with that requirement. What's anybody else think? You okay with it? I don't have any hardware no for it, honestly. When you add things like when available, it's pretty easy. Yeah, that's, yeah, it, it easy leaves that. Uh, able to. <laughs> never available? If it, well, if it, you know. It's probably not going to be available for me. <laughs> Just so I see where we're going here. You don't want to follow these I policies. Know. <laughs> I know. Just pigeonholing me. Okay. <laughs> Approvers. Just trying to keep so, people accountable. I know, I know. And I, it's funny because I'm the one arguing this, but I see this from the other side. I am the one that pays the piece of piece mm -hmm. where I work. I'm the one that struggles with employees that lose theirs. So I might have to take it. I might have to implement this. Borrow it. <laughs> well. Now that you've picked it apart. Now that I've picked it apart. <laughs> but, um, okay, so the, oh, where am I at? Um, B, approvers. And approvers, yes, B, approvers. So the approvers are in, like, say, our electeds. They are going to be the approvers for their people, correct? Yeah. We, and this doesn't apply to them because we can't fire them. Right. That was yeah. my thing. Is it do we going to have half of the people that if their if their electeds are just saying, oh yeah, it's okay, that's okay, approving everything? Do we have half of our staff that are following the policy? Because we can't fire the electeds. The electeds, though, trust me, they're not the problem. They are not the problem. Well, at this point, we have to, <laughs> don't we just have to trust that they are, that they have said, yes, they agree with this policy and that they are, they agree to follow it. Is doing the supervisor, he would be the supervisor for the road department, so he is right. going to be the approver. He would be the approver for anybody beneath him. Mm -hmm. You would be his approver. <clears throat> okay. And that is, uh, except Dewey and, um, Lisa are the only two non-elected supervisors. My dad is one. Oh, okay. I don't know if Doug has a credit card. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everybody else is elected. Okay. Um, who approves the judge's credit card charges? So those would be, um, they'll go through the regular AP. So that would be up to the two of you and Nathan. They come through, so it wouldn't be approved. Obviously, pre-approval. Um, and we don't because we don't do pre-approval for the electives. Like um, but if presumably when he's looking at those, he's and if Ellen or somebody saw something, they would flag it for him, basically. Um, okay. Because um, he's the second eye on the AP. We're getting really close. <laughs> I knew this one was going to take up a chunk of time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one more thing I think is all I had. 
Oh, two more. Two more. Um, okay, credit, can it, the, the expense pre approval form. And some of these questions might have already been answered, so maybe I don't need this one. Um, right, because we could verbally do this. Because I was worried about at a conference how you were going to get amounts of, you know, your meals and all the things you want to pre approval for. Okay, last thing. Um, on the last, very last page, the reimbursement method. It says check, cash, or salary deduction. Now, I understand if an employee terminates that a salary deduction would be a useful tool, but being someone that does payroll, mm -hmm. how does Ellen feel about having to um, do salary deductions for people when they misuse your credit, rather than giving them the responsibility to say write a check? I just feel like we're giving her a little extra work that. I think I primarily she will probably opt to do the check because it's traceable and it's easier. Mm -hmm. But to your point, if we have an employee who um, leaves okay. and makes in inappropriate uh, expense and expenditures and before they leave, mm -hmm. uh, we need to have a way of recouping that. I just, yeah, I would hate to see as a, as a person just that payroll, I would hate for employees to do that. Done it to say, oh, just take it out of my check. Well, and she could say, no, I want you to give me a check. Okay, then she has the ability to I do that. I think, it. yeah. That was all I had. Because ultimately, the approver has to sign off. So the approver can say, basically, no, you need to write a check mm -hmm. to the account. Okay. okay. Those were my questions. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> oh, it wasn't too bad. All right, so how do we feel about this? <sighs> I think I'm out of over. I'm, 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 <laughs> am I giving you the stink eye? Yes, I'm outvoted <laughs> on a couple of my big concerns, so let's just do it. The thing is, with any policy, so you'll notice in here that it has this handy dandy little revision description, and at the beginning it talks about the revision schedule when it needs to be reviewed. So keep in mind that Lisa will look at this again December 2020. And if there's anything that's not workable or if there's something that we need to clarify, we just refine the policy. It's okay. kind of standard. So don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's the law, but it's not like permanent. We can always modify things. Okay, that makes me feel a little more useful. <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion? Yes, we do. I move to adopt resolution number R2020-01. This is the right one, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and approve the use of county credit card policy as presented. I'll second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution number R2020-01 and approve the use of county card policy as presented. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. <laughs> oh, you guys. You were going to let it die without a we're second. Hard line. <laughs> hard line. Okay. Don't you need to be more? Yeah, see, we're just making you more accountable. <laughs> this is the, yeah, this is the Leslie policy. I should have renamed it. So uh, 6.4 is consider approval of resolution number R2020-02, a resolution declaring brain lab equipment as surplus. So this is a request that's coming um, from Nathan. Um, but basically, um, as you guys know, Grand Lab is not being used. We have quite a bit of equipment um, that's sitting in there that um, could maybe be used by mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. if we don't allow it to just sit and sort of crumble, fall yes. apart. Um, yeah, there does. So the idea would be that we <coughs> declare the Grand Labs equipment a surplus and then authorize um, Nathan to uh, basically dispose of it and give him the flexibility to decide based on what it is we're trying to get rid of, <laughs> whether to do a silver public auction donation or other legal manner available <coughs> have some flexibility because we have everything from old office furniture to actual lab equipment that may only have one or two buyers right. out there kind of thing so some of it that's obsolete that has some of it may be parts. going 
yeah um, somebody might want it for parts but so I just kind of when I drafted the resolution I kept it as broad as possible that he has leeway to dispose of that based on any sort of legally available means of getting rid of it. So that's that was one of my questions. Who decides whether it's surplus, we're gonna surplus or donate it? Is that bringing that up to unless you guys I mean you've seen the list. I did. I've actually physically seen what and we're there. talking about Nathan and I have been through the building probably a hundred together and in some different separate pieces about this. of equipment. Yeah. So unless we want to individually do that and do separate no, I resolutions, no, I mean, it just doesn't make not sense. All of them. I just didn't know if there was a, anything on here that we did not have any input on. What, what's happened to the mass spec? It's not on here. And I didn't know if that was something that's still in our possession. What yeah. is that? That's the um, it's I a GC. No it's, a, it's a mass spectrometer. It's a big piece of equipment that's really pretty expensive. I, depending on, I don't know how old the one is. That the, is. is that the piece of equipment they put in there and then build the wall all around it because it would fit through the door? Possible. I don't think so. Any question for me? I'll ask it. I can ask it. It's still there. Well, and I think but at some point in time, maybe the, question the court is, felt that it was theirs. So I'm just oh, curious. Really? Oh, I don't know. That's so I didn't know. I don't, so. You're not speaking a language that I... <laughs> That's a good question, but that is a question for me. Okay. Um, and what about the, the... You know, I saw that the artwork was on the list as to, to, be, just to be, you know, surplus or gotten rid of or something, and, and the conference room table and things like that. Do we not... Are we never going to use, you know, like as a kind of a meeting place that we would ever need? Do we not? We don't need it. We don't need it. We've never used that building. Well, in my case, I've had a couple some meetings of that there. Was I've had a couple meetings there at in that conference room. Mm -hmm. Recently, no. Previous yeah. court. So I didn't know if that was something. Like that. Well, that was my my thinking on some of that too. Was art, you know, some of that artwork. And, Stuff that we can bring here. I, I know they brought some things here, and we've exchanged, and we talked about exchanging this conference room table that's in the lower building, switching them out because the one there is a better. It's nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a better quality. Well, it, well, I just thought about this since you were talking about it, but as far as staging goes, it's like you know when you um, want to show perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. At least. Resource. Yes, it's be like, oh, look at that. Nice. There's, a hard, there's artwork and there's a nice conference. There's an entire nice. office set, though, in that one room that. I might still part of those. Pieces. Yeah, that we, I think that we could utilize without having to purchase something from anyone. Yeah. yeah, I just have questions about basically the artwork in the conference room uh, area. So I think if what there was we. Any value of keeping it there. I think what we could do is just to be clear in our conversation here that there may be some things on this list so this is like this was not a list that we recently created this was a hard copy yes. list that we then dug out of an old file yes. um, and so maybe the discussion here and the if the understanding is that Nathan is able to use some judgment and if you guys want to weigh in on certain things that you'd like him to keep in the building like the conference room table or the artwork mm -hmm. um, that he still is given leeway to surplus the rest um, but okay one of my concerns about I mean some of that artwork has value and the front door to me is uh, I'm surprised that somebody hasn't broken in and painted something at this point in time that was one of my concerns and I did gather up all of the office supplies, the pins and the rulers and the staplers, and, and we brought that all up and put it in the uh, supply closet. So mm -hmm. it's just, because there was a lot, because every little station had its own, so that we could utilize some of that. So are we thinking, would you like us to reduce this list and focus it in more tightly? To those things that well no I'm or thinking, do we like, want just the understanding with Nathan to be that there are things that he can 
keep, even if we surplus them, that he could still end up, we could end up actually not surplusing them. Well, and, and back to the fact that this is an old list, uh, you know, there's probably office chairs on here that were broken and we took to the landfill because mm -hmm. they were not, they weren't usable, they were, they were trash. So there's probably a lot of things maybe on this list that don't even exist. Some of these computers that are so out of date that they have no, they have no value. Yeah. Truly. Mm -hmm. right. That they should go to e-cycle instead. So. Mm -hmm. So what are you guys thinking? Well, I agree with Leslie on. Is there something there that belongs to the poor? What did they? I just remember yeah, in, in yeah, the past you know, talking about that up, um, the, the, there was just um, some discussion about the, the mass spec and what was going to happen with it and who it belonged to and I was just curious as to what its current status is. That I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and I'm not sure I don't want, um, and, and I'm sure I would be a part of that, um, a new inventory okay. of actual what is actually there. Okay. So how about this? How about I mean, it's been this sitting there this long. If we wait a little longer to actually go in and do an inventory and put some value on, how about and decide what we want to keep and what we want to. As next steps, if you and Nathan could take on that project and get us a an inventory and we'll just put this on pause okay um, keep the resolution and everything and then we'll just do a new attachment with the new inventory okay. basically and then we can you know if we want to pull the conference room table off of this list right. and all that kind of stuff then we could keep it okay. and maybe you could do a walkthrough and you know, say what your concerns are and where sure. you would think Things might be better utilized. Okay. Do you think we will? Do you, my, my idea, my thought about the conference table, though. Do you see us using it? I mean, I guess we have the drawing this building now. So, do you see us ever wanting to? Here's the thing: the conference table we can always surplus later. So at some point we'll have to come to a resolution with the grain land, yeah. and so it may that resolution may dictate what happens right. to the conference and room table. And leaving the conference room table and those chairs in there is. Okay. Yeah. Not a big deal. Okay. Okay. So for now, we're going to um, put this resolution on pause. Sherry and um, Nathan can give us a more um, targeted inventory, accurate, up-to-date inventory. And then once that's done, we'll get this back on the agenda for approval. Okay. Sound good? All right. Moving on. Um, consider approval of resolution number R2020-03, a resolution declaring transportation vehicle a surplus. So this is a um, 2010 Scion XD. It was purchased on nearly 10 years ago. It served its purpose. It's met the ODOT usage requirements of being in service for four years and over 100,000 miles. Um, Let's see, Marla wanted me to let you guys know their grant funds to be able to immediately replace it with an all-wheel drive vehicle. Um, and the suggestion here is that if we moved forward with declaring a surplus, that, sh that Marla would put it on an online public auction site, which is publicsurplus.com which is an easier way rather than doing sealed bids and we get kind of a wider. Well, I had a question, I had a concern about that, I guess. Um, have we used that before? Gary has used it before, is my understanding. I guess my thought was why do we not want to just keep this local? Well, and my thought was in the past, I know that we have donated surplus vehicles to other entities that are in need. And my understanding a few months ago is that the common school district um, could possibly have a need for a small vehicle when they have those smaller groups of athletic or class room sites where they don't need to use a bus to take someone to an event, that they have a pickup that is less than desirable to drive. Mm -hmm. So that was my thought I like too. the idea of donating before 
surplus and things as well. But I mean, how do we how do we make it fair to other public entities to say that we have this and who's interested in it? Because I know that in the past that they have been um, lack of a better word, gifted to another public entity. Um, and my question then too was, did other public entities get to weigh in and say, you know, we can yeah, use it too? Or was it just whoever spoke up first? And I think at least since we've taken office, we've kind of been with the surplus at first, and then if there's no bidders, then donate it, I think is what we did with at least one of the vehicles, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I don't know. Well, because I guess, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. I guess if you surplus it and you put it out for bid, if there was an entity that was interested in it, they could potentially bid on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if these, and these usually go for a kind of low, well, minimum, there's bids 3,000. I don't know, I just do like the idea of donating. Um, and I kind of like the idea of keeping it local, which when I saw the public surplus.com, I thought, mm -hmm. It could be, though, if you wanted to keep it local, that, or do both, you could, we could basically have it available on publicsurplus.com, but put a notice in the paper that that's how people put their bids in. So rather than do a sealed bid process, if right. people locally wanted to bid on it, they just need to go to public surplus and put in their bid. So we would be but opening up, it but locally. opening it up to a bigger audience, they might not be as likely to end up with it. Which I mean, are we trying to? I, I guess I'm not sure. Exactly. Are we trying to make more, more likely to make money? Are we trying to make more money, or are we trying to? I don't know. Let some of the entities around here have some of our used surplus vehicles. Yeah, because didn't a grant buy that in the first place? Uh, most likely, if it's transportation, then yeah, it was probably so, no top ramp. Do we need three thousand dollars? <laughs> so what's the thought? Are you thinking? <laughs> but I don't know what the process is to. I'd like to see us try to donate it to some other entity that I was in need. Okay. But if, but I don't know what that looks like. How do we put that out there so that I want it to be fair too? I don't want to just say. I know that the Condon High School could use another vehicle. Because here's the thing. Maybe Arlington High School could use one as well. What do we or do if the library? I think if you have more than one response, then you surplus. Then you put then it you have to put it in, and you have to fight for it. Okay. Maybe. So how about this? How about We're trying to make it more difficult? Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really quiet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. I just feel the lines in my <laughs> So here's what I'm thinking. Um, so let me check in with council and see when we're donating something, if there's any process that we actually, like does it need to be publicly noticed? What does that look like? Because I don't think we just donated something right. without yeah, having without, the surplus yeah. first. So let me double check on process. And okay. then we can also reach out to the school district if that's the most likely person who may be interested because I mean if Michelle turns around and says I'm not and we're right, not interested right. then, then maybe it's not even a thing and we go back to a different yeah. um, option so let's do I'll do a little bit of research and figure out what the process is and we'll do an initial kind of calling out to organizations that maybe have expressed a need previously okay thank you and then we'll bring it back <laughs> All right, let's go on to, um, you're almost there now, let's go to, I already did this one, 6.5, 6.6, consider approval of resolution number R2020-04, resolution establishing the fiscal year 2020-2021 operational support grant program. Okay, so did we have adjustments to that? We did have an adjustment. Okay. The only thing that we discussed 
much was the percentage? Was well, just modifying the 15% or the 20% matching funds. Matching funds. So, um, Okay. After all that talking, I did a lot. <clears throat> Were there any other concerns with any of our clients? I think so. Did you? No, I didn't. Yeah, I think that was the only thing that we. <clears throat> um, so I would make a motion then. If, are we ready? Yes, we're yes. ready. I would move to adopt resolution number R2020 04 and establish the fiscal year 2020. 2021 operational support grant program guidelines as amended and the amendments being that throughout the document wherever it references match funding that that figure be 15% instead of 20% I second okay it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution number R2020-04 and establish the fiscal year 2020 2021 operational support grant program guidelines as amended the amendment being that um, anywhere in the document that references matching funds, that the figure be 15% rather than 20. Is there further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. 6.7 me hold. And so we will go on to, I only have the front page too. Um, and I missed that. The way the spacing was on here the first time, I, I was, and I was going to ask, do we just, are we going to keep up the committee appointments? But I, because I didn't see it because it was so close to the top, I was like, oh, <laughs> consider until the 2020 night. court board and committee appointments. Yes. yes. So what you have in your packet is the current um, ones that we just, the ones we just completed. The, um, the, Two that we added were the Fiber Council, which was created since then. And then I also just went ahead and put on the Association of Oregon County's Ledge Committee so that we could formalize that um, appointment. Okay. Um, so the question is, are you guys happy with your assignments? We want to discuss change. Leslie looks like she wants to give up road department. <laughs> no, no, real. no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm okay with them. I, I just want for the record to say that I reached out to Cape Co board mm -hmm. and was told that it didn't necessarily have to be right. a commissioner from Gillum County, uh, that it was Gillum and Wheeler was the position and I believe someone from Wheeler County has filled that, but I okay. would leave that there in case, in case they a, come back and say we need someone to fill this position. Perfect. That would be me. That works for me. Um, I'm okay with what it is. Okay. So is there a motion then? Well, I move to approve the 2020 County Court Member Committee assignments as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the 2020 <coughs> court, uh, County Court Member Committee <coughs> assignments as presented. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any uh, opposed? Motion carries. Okay, um, I think we're probably on to court member reports. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see the ones I copied out here probably have a Leslie, you go first. I know. <laughs> okay, mine's, mine's really fast. fast. No problem. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Mine's, mine's pretty fast. Just coming off of a long Christmas break. Lovely. Um, the only thing I think I really went to in the last couple of weeks was the Merkley. Um, um, first was the elected officials type meeting, and then the town hall, um, which I found to be very interesting. Uh, some of the topics that the citizens brought up were um, broadband, of course, uh, prescription drugs, foster care system, foreign trade, dam removals, and recipients in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it was it was a good it was a good town hall, and I always find them. Um, was it well attended? Pre yes. It's actually about 20, 20 people. About 20. Um, so pretty educational. Um, the only thing I have coming up, I think, in the next couple weeks is the North Central Public Health District meeting on next Tuesday, January 14th. And that's it. And are you guys moving forward with replacing? It's supposed to be on the agenda. <laughs> it's supposed to be on the agenda. Okay. Well, um, I, the last NORCOR meeting, I did by phone because um, 
the schools all around us were closed, <laughs> so I did that by phone. Um, and we were um, just discussing, uh, continued the, uh, I think we approved the, the bylaws, and that was taken care of. We elected um, our officers, and we just elected our past group. And we thought I would jump on that really quickly, but it wasn't broken, so I didn't think it needed to be fixed. We're making a lot of progress, and it's a good group. The administrative team that mm -hmm. is in place is they're doing a great job. It's taking away from the regular duties, but we're still looking at what we're going to do about what what a new administrator looks like mm -hmm. and what that would entail. So that's something ongoing, and we have another meeting on Thursday, the twenty third at ten in, at Northport, and. I plan to attend the um, Port of Arlington meeting on Tuesday the 14th. And the Tri-County and Frontier Telenet meetings in Morrow on the 29th. Oh, I don't know, and I don't know if I'm going to be back. I'm going to Vegas oh. for work. Oh, really? It's oh, work. that's right. It's that's work. right. So, I mean, I may miss that. So, that's what's up in my world. Sounds good. I haven't seen the agenda, though, the agenda. For Tri County, yeah, it it's out. Light. I yeah. saw, I saw it's how, uh, it's the it's veteran service officer, and then I asked her to add building codes to it. Okay, um, so it's not a that's it, it's not a very heavy agenda. Okay. Um, so for me, let me think a couple things. Um, I wanted to give an update on the port since you mentioned that I did send um, an email to the port board. Um, basically with an outline, uh, Jeremy, our council, helped me with that, um, proposing um, that we move forward with discussions on resolving the Willow Creek thing. And um, so we talked about, uh, in it, I let them know that I would be coming to the meeting next week. Interestingly enough, it's not on their agenda. <laughs> I oh. saw it come out, I did yeah. not see Willow Creek on their agenda. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe um, Ron Wilson will probably do it during his president's report or something. You know, there's several areas in there where they have reports, and so maybe they're just folding it into one of their report areas. Um, so anyway, we'll see how that progresses. Um, on building codes, uh, we are moving forward with that. We heard back from the state early this week, late last week, that um, there was a question about state. The state requires us to have um, basically, if you have control of your building codes program, which we do right now, but the state is doing it on our behalf. If we were to pull it back and contract with like the state of, or the county, um, city of Boardman, that we would have to have staff available. There'd have to be a place within the county that people could bring their permits to. So I emailed um, the state just to clarify that is that the rule? Are you going to be enforcing that? Do we need to have a plan? Uh, do we need to have a building codes office basically in the courthouse? They said um, because they believe that the service to the community will be vastly improved by going with the city of Boardman, which is telling when the state says that <laughs> to you, um, then their service that they would waive that requirement for us they would really like us to stop using their services and so go then, to the city appointment. So then what does that look like for our residents in getting permits then? Would they, is there something online for them so they don't have to go into Borden to get something? So I need to call Glenn, now that I've gotten that clarification from the state, I need to go back to the city of Boardman. What it looks like they're doing with the other entities, <coughs> so they provide for like Morrow County, right looks like they have an application that's just online that's fillable that you could just email to him so but I want to double check that that's actually how they do their process before I say for certain that that's how they do it um, so for now it doesn't it doesn't look like we would need to adjust staffing or look to hire new staff or change you know job descriptions or anything like that for current staff to make that work um, I'm gonna I am gonna ask the state to actually 
They put it in an email, but it was a pretty informal email, and so I'm going to ask them to actually put that in a letter that we can put in the file in case there's ever a new person at the state who forgets why they were so eager to not serve us anymore. Um, so, uh, but we're moving forward on that. Um, the last little bit that needs to be worked out is the electrical inspection. The state uh, keeps saying that they do not want, they keep saying they don't split, so either all your building codes is with them or not. But that is not the case because I talked to the city of Boardman and asked them, who does your electrical inspection? Couldn't we just partner? And they said, oh, the state does. <laughs> so, we may, I'm going to go back to the state probably this afternoon and say, okay, if you want us off your, um, on all of the other things, we need you to still do our electrical inspections because those are the hardest inspectors to find. Um, and if they absolutely refuse, then I've started conversations with um, Wasco County and with Hood River County who will have electrical inspectors. So um, we would likely, if that happened, need to look at using the MACOG reserves probably to pay to pay for that service potentially um, but I'm still hoping the state will just take it because um, they're eager to get the rest off of their workload so and then I also asked Glenn if he could send over um, the IGs that they've used for us say Morrow County and I have not seen that yet but as soon as he does my intention is to just start moving forward and having council drafting unless you guys are resistant to that so okay so i will move forward with that um and i'll keep you guys apprised of developments on this day um but we're moving forward my goal is to have that wrapped up hopefully by the end of the fiscal year would be ideal if we could get that done um let me think if there was anything else so do you know what's happening with Wasco between Wasco County and Sherman County and how their thing is progressing and what, what where we're at with the McCall monies? And My understanding, the last time I talked to them, and that was at AOC, so that's been oh, right, six, yeah. eight weeks ago, um, that they were still negotiating. Um, two of the commissioners in Wasco County, I think, um, expressed concerns at the initial drafts that their administrator produced wow. and um, are trying to kind of uh, be more favorable to Sherman County, um, be better partners to Sherman County. And so it sounded like they're getting closer, um, but that they still don't have an agreement. <clears throat> So, and for now, uh, the tricky part for us, um, uh, Wasco County has at least been notified that we were in agreement on the 80-10-10 kind of split. But the situation we have is we don't have a place to put it in a budget and it has right. to be segregated from funds. And so my intention is to not, to just ask Wasco County to hold on to the money until we can yeah, add it into the budget and actually put it someplace where it's segregated and we're not violating state law. Okay. Um, so, um, but that's coming. It's coming. Yeah. The agreement is there. We're just, there's a couple of last pieces that need to be put together. Okay. Um, the other thing that Lisa and I are going to start working on, and I, I left it down in my office, but I will bring it next time. Um, we're going to start talking about strategic planning. Okay. And Umatilla County, as luck would have us, sent their strategic plan, which literally is a trifold brochure. It's that small. <laughs> okay. um, but actually very, like you can see exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. And it's, I showed it to our um, staff yesterday and they, I mean, Teddy's in the office, yeah. thought it was, or in the room, thought, it was really cool and something you could actually mail to everybody in the county and say this is what we're doing. It's not very, it's not scary. It's yeah. not scary. Right. So not yeah, like, after the meeting, come down to my office and I'll show you the trifold. Um, but anyway, so Lisa and I are talking about doing that and I asked her, do we think we need a consultant for that? And she said, honestly, the consultants that come in take so much time getting to know you before they can help you that she thought was something like that, that she could probably help facilitate that for us and we could handle that process internally. Cool. So we're gonna come up with a process and I'm 
hoping it, it may be on the next agenda that we actually start talking about a timeline and a process but if not that then maybe the first um, meeting in February we'll try to have something we can look for mm -hmm. and get that done mm -hmm. um, I think that's it those are the high points that I have um, for anything else on court reports mm -hmm. okay for announcements and next meetings, um, did we want to do a special meeting, a very brief special meeting next Wednesday to get the capital yes. projects yeah. grant approved yeah. so that the application is get started? Okay, so um, let's do, I think Wednesday, Wednesday probably makes the most sense. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about the 15th of January, nine o'clock, nine that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then because it's gonna be short, we can do what we normally do, which is if you guys wanna call in, um, we've already discussed the details, it's just me basically getting, capturing what we talked about during the work session okay. in the well, guidelines. On the exactly, so let's do um, January 15th at 9 a.m. Okay. If that works. And um, we'll have a call-in option if you guys want to use it, or you're okay. of course always welcome. Sounds good. Depends on the weather. And then uh, next meeting is January 22nd here in the courthouse. Um, Sherry mentioned, but I'll just reiterate for folks in the audience: Tri County Courts on the 29th. Printer telling it is immediately after that. 11:30. Um, yep. And other things that are going on: the Frontier 911 Board will meet on the 21st. We always do Tri County Community Corrections after that, so just wanted to flag that for you. Okay. Um, so far, the talk about moving the PSAP has died down. Okay. Uh, with the legislature passing the increase in the 911 tax, we're going to have more money coming into the center. Um, so that it seems to now that Frontier Telenet is stable, that talk seems to have quieted lately. So I think it'll probably be a pretty quiet meeting. Um, and I think that's it. Does anybody else have anything else? No, I do not. All right, it's 11.20 and we'll adjourn the meeting. All right.